all loose items in the pouch in front of you. Have a safe and informative journey. Hello, I'm Nathan Hartman, and this is DreamFinders, a podcast about the creative culture of Disney theme parks. Locomotive transportation isn't as prevalent as it used to be. With the emergence of cars, the rumble on the tracks, and that piercing whistle is just something that passes us by every now and again. That is, unless you're at a Disney theme park. A staple of the classic Disneyland experience, these steam trains can take you anywhere from New Orleans to Toontown, and its bell and whistle are a constant presence throughout any of the parks. For many, their fascination with trains and theme parks are linked, thanks to no small part for Walt's own passion for both. Today's guest, Michael Campbell, is one of those people, but in many ways, he's far beyond a normal hobbyist. The foremost scholar on all things Disney trains, Michael has not only curated exhibits on the subject for the Walt Disney Family Museum, among others, but helped renovate Walt's very own hobby barn so visitors could tour it. Michael was kind enough to chat with me about the origins of his Disney train passion, how locomotives inspired Walt throughout his life, and how he came to have an engine from the Fort Wilderness Railroad in his own backyard. All of that and more is coming right up on DreamFinders. Michael Campbell, welcome to DreamFinders. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So now your passion for Disney trains... Uh, begins exactly where you would think it would, which is Disneyland. Tell us a little bit about um, your first Disney train ride and why that uh, stuck with you such in such a big way. <laughs> it was a seminal moment in my life. I was probably six years old, and this was in the late 60s. We lived in Northern California, and my parents weren't wealthy. We couldn't really afford to take significant vacations. Uh, so my first trip to uh, Disneyland uh, was was just this amazing experience for me. I had built this thing up in my mind. And to be clear, I thought Disneyland was a railroad with some stuff in the middle of it. <laughs> and I'm standing at the Main Street station waiting for the train to roll in. The station agent sees me there. And you know, this cute little blonde-haired six-year-old wearing a hickory stripe overalls and a hat and bandana and such. And when the train comes in, he goes to open the gate. And I'm going to go run and get on the cars. And he says, no, you come with me, son. And he takes me by the hand around that little barricade that they have. And he takes me up to the locomotive mm -hmm. and lifts me up and puts me on the footplate. And, and I'm just, I'm in seventh heaven at this point. <laughs> so the engine crew are trying to explain to me how a steam locomotive works. And, and I'm six years old. I know everything. So I've done, no, I'll tell you guys how to operate your own locomotive. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and we're having this wonderful time. And then it's time to go. And the engineer picks me up and puts me on his lap and tells me to reach up and pull the whistle cord twice. And I knew what that meant. It meant we're going. And I got a grand circle tour from the right hand seat mm. of the Ernest S. Marsh locomotive. And even though it's been decades, since then, I, I can tell you to this day uh, what it felt like, the sound of the engine, the heat from the fire, the flash of the fire in the tunnels. It was exhilarating. It was thrilling. It was a little frightening. And it just seared into me this, this passion for steam railroading. I'd forgotten that I had parents at this point. And when we <laughs> made our way around to Main Street Station, I suddenly remembered they existed. And so I went running off to go tell them all about this. And the next part I didn't remember until... My mother pointed it out to me years later. Apparently, she asked me how it was, and I said, well, it was just insanely great, as a six-year-old could say. And apparently, I told her at that point, when I grow up, I want a real Disney train in my backyard. <laughs> About 30 years after that moment, I put a real Disney train in my backyard. And the story of how we got to that point, and uh, whether that was a blessing or a curse, <laughs> is something we can explore as we have a chance to chat a little more. That's for sure. Um, let's head way back and talk a little bit about how central, and I, and I think truly central, trains are in uh, the making of Disneyland. Tell us a little bit about Carrollwood Pacific Rail uh, Railroad and what that sort of meant to Walt. Uh, the world into which Walt Disney was born was very different from ours. Uh, the 
railroads weren't just an inconvenience that slowed down traffic when you were trying to get someplace. They, they were a literal lifeline to all these rural agrarian communities across the United States. In many cases, a steam locomotive was the most advanced piece of technology that these people had ever seen. When the train came into these small towns, like Marceline, Missouri, where uh, Walt grew up, uh, it, it was an event. Uh, people would stop and look at it roll by. Walt, uh, like I said, many Americans have this in their, their history, had family that worked for the railroad. His dad uh, was a carpenter that, that helped build part of the Transcontinental Railroad. And his uh, father's cousin, who they called Uncle Mike, Mike Martin, was an operating engineer for the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad. His normal route would run him through uh, Marceline. He had a special whistle signal that he'd blow for uh, the Disney boys. And uh, they knew when, that, when they heard that, that Uncle Mike was in the cab. When he'd come over for visits, he'd tell them about what life was working on the railroad. So Walt had this, this wonderful love of railroad instilled into him at an early age. It's, it's not surprising then that when uh, he became a teenager, one of his first jobs was working on a railroad. His brother Roy had been a news butch on uh, uh, some trains out of Kansas City. Uh, this was an independent vendor that would go up and down commuter cars and sell cigarettes, newspapers, candy, soda pop, fruit, that kind of thing, out of these little hampers they'd carry on. So Walt uh, took a job as that. Uh, for just a few months, it ended up being a bit of a bust because people took advantage of these kids and sold them rotten fruit and things like that. But there, there was a side effect that would uh, almost literally change the world. During his breaks uh, on the trains, he'd uh, go up into the uh, baggage portion of a car that's called a combine because it would have an area for passengers, an area for luggage and freight. He'd go out the front door of this and crawl over the coal tender and get up to the cab while well, the engine is moving. You know, the train is in motion at this point. This is way before OSHA or anything like that. Mm. And the uh, engine crew taught him how to operate a steam locomotive in exchange for him giving them apples and sodas and things like that. Uh, and, and it just locked into Walt. I love trains. We have to flash forward a little bit. Uh, Walt comes out to California on uh, a train, uh, and we know the story of how he started uh, the Disney studio with his brother, Roy, and, and how that progressed. World War II was a, a very tumultuous time for the studio. They essentially got taken over. They lost a lot of their staff for the war effort. Uh, and then there was a bit of a struggle to come out of that. Uh, so it was a very stressful time for Walt, and he needed a hobby. He was working, you know, six, seven days a week. Uh, and he takes this uh, trip to see the Chicago Rail Fair brought along Ward Kimball, one of his animators with him. Uh, and they, they saw these trains rolling by in this pageant on the shores of Lake Michigan, uh, recreation of Lincoln's funeral train. Uh, he even got to, Walt got to participate in a kind of a Keystone Cops reactment of a train robbery and such. And, and they had a, a great time. On the way back from that, he and Ward stopped at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan, and they saw a recreated little town that had the, the Wright Brothers Bicycle Shop and Thomas Edison's factory or uh, at laboratory. Uh, and it was surrounded by a little train, had a steamboat, a merry-go-round and such like that. And Walt started to get this idea to have a, a magical little park where people could have fun together, uh, adults and children. So uh, he works on several different ideas, uh, comes up with this and for a Mickey Mouse Park and goes and presents it to the Burbank City Council. His idea was to build this next to the studio. Maybe they could even give studio tours as part of the entertainment there. Burbank tossed him out and said, we don't want any squawking carousels in our town. Uh, so uh, one of the more remarkable things about Walt Disney, and I've had the great fortune of getting to know and work with people that uh, not only knew him, worked with him, but in many cases were family members, uh, the, the, one of the most remarkable things about him is, is that he just didn't give up. When he was convinced of a great idea, maybe it didn't happen in the way or the time that he had hoped to, but he, he found a way to eventually make it happen. So he, he takes his plans and he says, you know what, it's too small of an idea. We've got more opportunity here. Let's do something bigger. And that, of course, became Disneyland, located in this sleepy little uh, community uh, out in the middle of nowhere at the time uh, called Anaheim just a bunch of orange groves and such. 
And everybody thought that this was, was Walt's folly and it wouldn't work. And of course, we all know how that turned out. What, what I find remarkable about uh, his first description of Disneyland is, is the emphasis that, that he placed on railroading. He said, I just want it to look like nothing else in the world and it should be surrounded by a train. Mm. Uh, the, the train has the ability not only to carry people around the park, but to also kind of shut out the outside world, which is a, a dark and scary place at times, as I think we all know right now, and and find a way to escape into this world where good prevails and and right is is always on top. And, and it's the way life should be, not the way life is. Uh, and it's surrounded by a train. So you, you can draw a direct line from... Uh, Walt doing something kind of dangerous as a teenager <laughs> to all the Disney theme parks and the Disney empire around the world today. Uh, the sun never sets on a Disney theme park. You know, I understand right now there aren't very many people in the Disney theme park, sadly, uh, but that will turn around and, and uh, literally 100,000 people a day ride on a steam-powered railroad somewhere in the world because of Walt Disney. Mm-hmm. And that, that's a remarkable legacy. You mentioned, of course, uh, that Walt went with uh, Ward Kimball uh, to the Chicago Railroad, Railroad Fair. Um, mm-hmm. But it was also, of course, Ollie Johnston uh, also sort of, uh, I guess, wetted Walt's whistle when it came to model trains and things of that nature. I was curious about the overall culture of train hobbyists in the 1950s. This seems like the, the peak of that, especially when you consider the Chicago Railroad Fair. I don't think lasts much longer after Walt's visit, if I remember correctly. Um, what was that culture in the 50s like? It, well, it, it's a remarkable time because people still had a lot of first-person connection mm-hmm. with railroading. Uh, in the earliest part of the 20th century, air travel was, was non-existent, and then it was frightfully expensive when it first you know came out. It wasn't until really the 60s and, and the advent of jet travel that it became uh, more viable. Uh, there were national uh, highways, but uh, travel in cars of that era, not a lot of fun. Train travel was the way to go. It was luxurious. It was comfortable. Uh, rail traffic for passengers was prioritized over freight tra- traffic, which is not the case today. Uh, so it was a very efficient way for you to get where you needed to go. So a lot of people had first-person fond memories of, of railroading. Uh, some of the earliest uh, mechanical toys uh, that were ever built were of trains. They, these date back to the 1840s, 1850s clockwork trains. Kimball had a wonderful collection of these. Uh, so it, it, you have people that worked in the industry, people that, that experienced that industry. So model railroading was just a natural progression of that. It was a way to capture that romance and that sense of adventure and that kinetic energy in a miniature way so that you could build your own little model railroad layouts. Walt had a, a great love of miniatures himself. And he was actually a, a, a pretty skilled uh, carpenter, and he would make his own little furniture and, and such. And a lot of that is on display up at the Walt Disney Family Museum in San Francisco. Uh, it, so it's not surprising then that, that when he found out that there was this group of people that had model trains that actually ran on live steam, like the big size trains did, that he would want to get into that hobby. And we, we owe a debt of gratitude to uh, Kimball and, as you mentioned, to Ollie Johnston for that. Both of them had live steam railroads. Kimball had a three-foot gauge, uh, that's the space between the, the rails on, on the railroad, uh, size locomotive in his backyard. He called it the Grizzly Flats Railroad. Ollie Johnston had a one twelfth size uh, locomotive uh, running around his home in La Cunada, Flint Ridge. But it operates just the same way that a full-size steam locomotive does. Boils water, burns coal, so forth like that. And so he had the chance to play with uh, uh, the big trains, the small trains, and he decided to have a, a railroad itself. Decided to build a live steam railroad at your house. Very helpful if you're the uh, head of a motion picture studio because you've got this great machine shop that can uh, <laughs> uh, help you build uh, these kind of things. Back in the early 50s, there, there weren't nearly the amount of resources available today to, to have a little live steam railroad of your own. Uh, so he went to the machine shop and he had uh, the head of uh, the machine shop, Roger Brogy, uh, who co-invented the multi-plane camera and was this uh, mechanical genius, uh, helped build this backyard railroad called the, the Carrollwood Pacific. So Walt oper- he bought a, a parcel of land, five acres in Holmby Hills, uh, next to Beverly Hills in Los Angeles, uh, specifically with the intent of building this live steam railroad at his property. 
Uh, it was very cleverly designed by one of the uh, um, studio draftsmen uh, who was also a live streamer uh, and, and essentially had eight scale miles of track uh, where you could travel without being on the same track in the same direction, switches and tunnels. And, and it was it was very elaborate. Uh, one of the I'm going to take a slight departure. here. One of the wonderful aspects of railroading that's been, I think, true since model railroading began. And it's certainly true today. It's it's a shared hobby. Model railroaders, by and large, are gregarious. Uh, trains are more fun with more people on your trains. <laughs> it's it's not really a kind of a private hobby. It's meant to be shared. Uh, so Walt was happy to host people at his home to come over. He had uh, friends, family members, of course, uh, celebrities. Uh, there's some famous footage of uh, the recently uh, late Kirk Douglas uh, operating the Lily Bell, the locomotive from the Carrollwood Pacific Railroad. Uh, in 1954. Uh, and so it, it got to be kind of a, a well-known thing. Walt's Carolwood Pacific was featured in uh, not just hobbyist magazines, but it started to make its way into mainstream media. There was a, a large article on it in Look Magazine, which was a large tabloid of the, the era. And people would show up at his house on the weekend saying, well, can I have a ride? Just total strangers. <laughs> Walt was a nice guy and he'd invite them in and they'd go for rides and such. Uh, but it was getting a little out of hand. One day he uh, had a, a little accident on the railroad where uh, some escaping steam from the locomotive burnt a little girl's leg. Uh, not seriously, she recovered, but it, he realized that he had a, a tremendous liability on his hands. Going back to what I said earlier, though, about him just not giving up, uh, he decided to shut down the Carrollwood Pacific, but he didn't give up on the thought of using trains to entertain people. And that's how the railroad aspect got weaved into what would become uh, Disneyland. Mm. Interestingly, and if you look closely at the, the famous Herbie Ryman uh, original sketch of Disneyland, and you look to where essentially the submarine attraction is uh, these days, uh, there was supposed to be a land called Lilliputian Land. And, and it was um, kind of like the storyboat ride uh, where it had miniature buildings and, and uh, such. But... The, the transportation through this land was the Lily Bell locomotive. Uh, he intended to run his train at the park. Uh, and uh, it would be, you know, this one eight size uh, train. Uh, they, they eventually abandoned that because uh, you can't carry many passengers on a one eight size steam locomotive uh, as compared to what you can carry on a three foot size locomotive. And I also think that once Walt had a chance to have his own essentially full size locomotive, you kind of forgot about the little one. <laughs> There's also this interesting thing about um, how Walt always had these, like, not always, but had these side companies away from Disney proper that would sort of work in tangent with the company on different things. And am I correct by saying that the uh, his his Walt Disney Miniature Railroad Company ends up evolving over time into Imagineering? <laughs> I, I'm impressed by your, your knowledge, and that is exactly uh, uh, what happened. Not necessarily from a corporate legal perspective, but but from a form, fit, and function perspective, that's what went on. So Walt develops the Lily Bell, and as I mentioned, there weren't a lot of resources in, in the early 1950s to have your own miniature locomotive. Uh, so he said, well, we built all these castings, and we have all this know-how. You know, we can do it for other groups. So they formed uh, the Walt Disney Miniature Locomotive Company, uh, which was located 500 South Buena Vista Street. And if you recognize that address, it's now the official address of the headquarters, of the Walt Disney Company. Back in the day, that was the back door of the studio. And uh, so he was literally running this <laughs> little cottage business out of the back door of the Walt Disney Studio. Uh and he, they didn't sell very many uh, locomotive parts. There are a few folks that I've met that actually have uh, Disney-built uh, uh, engines, mm. and then they, they run them. Uh, they're beautiful. They're, they're essentially identical to the uh, Lily Bell. But it wasn't an enormous business. When Walt got the idea to, to do something magical where people could have fun together, this was a completely radical idea. And, and the reason being is that up to that point, the Disney – business model was we make entertainment that people go to a theater to watch. That's what we do. Our stuff is, is uh, essentially sold through a reseller, which is a movie theater. They take a part of the profits. They have the concessions, but we get the rental of, 
of the film. The longer the film plays, the more money we get. That was their business model. And, and if you are in love with that model, you'd say, why would I want to build a theme park? It makes no sense at all. For one thing, there is no such thing as a theme park. The closest analogy is an amusement park. And amusement parks of that era were pretty seedy, mm -hmm. uh, in, especially in the United States. They were run down. They were you know, dangerous, sometimes uh, unclean. Not something that a wholesome company would really want to be associated with. Of course, Walt had a very different vision, but when there's no frame of reference, it can be difficult for people to make that leap of faith and understand what he was pursuing. So Roy was not in favor of uh, the Disney studio getting into the amusement park business. And Walt said, fine, I'll, I'll pay for it myself. So the, the folks, the first Imagineers and the design work that was done was paid for out of Walt's own pocket. Uh, and, and he formed a company. Um, and don't quote me on this because I may get it wrong, but essentially it was Walt Disney uh, Incorporated. And they came up with the original concepts for Disneyland. And eventually Roy would get on board with it. And then the, the studio would, would uh, not only contribute to the effort on a wholesale basis, but then they would go out and try to raise money from bankers and such. Uh, the an initial design work was still done by uh, WED, Walter Elias Disney uh, Incorporated. Eventually, the Walt Disney Company would acquire uh, WED. There were still some things that Walt owned personally. He, he actually owned some radio stations, some movie theaters, and such like that. And that business would get put into a different organization called Retlaw Enterprises. Uh, and then Retlaw, of course, being Walter spelled backwards. <laughs> uh, Walt was fond of that whole spelled backwards thing. <laughs> the the Carewood Pacific, uh, even though it went around the whole house, uh, the main part of it was in the backyard in this natural depression, uh, and he called it Yen Sid Valley because, of course, Yen Sid backwards is, is Disney. <laughs> uh, so Retla Enterprises had had these uh, holdings, but and this is a key point in the in Walt's uh, entire railroad story. Even though the Disney Studio, Walt Disney Productions, as it was called at the time, uh, had the majority interest in Disneyland Incorporated. Walt retained ownership of the railroad, first under Walt Disney Incorporated and then later uh, under Retlaw Enterprises. If you worked on the railroad during Walt's lifetime, you worked directly for Walt. Uh, essentially, they were a franchisee, a lessee in the park. Hmm. So when a, a guest would go and ride the railroad, they were paying Walt directly for that. Uh, a little side note. Uh, Walt uh, loved the railroad, and he was very busy running the company and, and plussing everything. But when he had a chance, he kept a, a pair of uh, hickory stripe overalls in his little apartment above the um, fire station on Main Street. And he would change into that and then go backstage, and he'd go tap the shoulder of the engineer who was in the cab of the locomotive at that time and say, go take a break. <laughs> and, and Walt would operate the train whenever he could. Uh, and a lot of the guests in the park had no idea that they were riding a train being operated by Walt Disney himself. <laughs> uh, and, and so that really shows that personal connection, even though he could have sold the railroad to, to Disneyland Incorporated or make it part of, of that whole enterprise. He owned it himself because it was that important to him. It was that connection to his childhood. Another really uh, interesting connection between trains and Imagineering, of course, is Harper Goff, who uh, many know as, a, as an Imagineering legend, but also another hobbyist who I would I would say would never have probably worked for Walt Disney if not for train hobbyists' uh, interests. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about how uh, they first met. So there are two stories on how they first met. There is the official story, and then there's the what we think actually happened story. <laughs> The, the official story is that uh, Harper Goff was a, a brilliant set designer and artist. He worked for a number of studios in the, uh, in the 40s and 50s. Uh, he also designed for Harper's Magazine and so forth. Uh, you, you, his, his work was everywhere, and a lot of the look of these films is, is directly representative. He had this great romantic style. He uh, was also a talented musician, played the banjo, and eventually would uh, play with the Firehouse 5 Plus 2, which was this... Um, Dixon and Jazz Group, formed by Ward Kimball, made up of folks that worked at the studio. All around great guy, really fun guy. Uh, so he also was into live steam miniature railroading. There, there was a store in uh, London 
uh, called Basic Loke, and they sold these miniature locomotives. They focused in on European style things. Harper goes over there to uh, to purchase one of these locomotives. This is way before the internet; and you could do things remotely. There was no Amazon.com for um, live steam railroading back then. Uh, so he goes over there, and he is told. Oh, that locomotive that you, you came over here all the way just to buy? Well, we sold it four hours ago to this bloke named Disney. And, and Harper is devastated. You know, he wanted to buy that locomotive. And so he finds out that Walt is staying at a nearby hotel and reaches out to him and they have dinner. And, and Walt is not interested in selling the <laughs> locomotive. That's why he went all the way over there. Of course, he didn't know Harper wanted to buy it. He wouldn't have you know, been rude about it. Uh, but they get to talking and he talks about his background, shows Walt some of his work. Walt essentially hires him on the spot, and one of the first things he did was to work on the concept of uh, Disneyland. Harper Goff uh, used his experiences growing up in Fort Collins, Colorado, uh, to base the look and feel of Main Street. You know, it's, it's often told that Main Street USA is based on Marceline, Missouri, and, and certainly the concept of having a single path down through town, you know, is, is reflected in that. There's no question about that. But if you look at the design aesthetic, Marceline doesn't look much like Main Street USA. It does look like some of the buildings that were there when Harper Groff, uh, Goff grew up mm. in Fort Collins. So uh, he's, he's very much responsible for that whimsical, beautiful charm, that Victorian era charm that, that we see in Main Street USA and, and actually is repeated through uh, the rest of it, uh, the park. Uh, as, as far as the, the official story goes, that's it. Uh, what what I have learned recently is that Harper had been doing work for the Disney studio well before that train was acquired <laughs> uh, as a freelancer. And it's almost certain that Harper and Walt knew each other before then. Uh, so it's, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how true that story is. That that's I'm going to go off on a tangent, but I will come back to this. <laughs> uh, as you probably know, uh, I created an exhibition that celebrated Walt Disney and trains for the California State Railroad mm -hmm. Museum. It opened in 2002 and ran through 2003. Uh, as part of this, uh, we had to get permission and the support of Walt's personal family, uh, specifically his daughter, Diane Disney Miller. The state of California was totally out of money at that time, so they couldn't afford to put on the exhibition, but they loved the idea. Diane had had uh, great success uh, with a couple of things. Our relocation of, of the Carrollwood Barn to Griffith Park, uh, an exhibition uh, staged at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. And so she was very interested in, in getting Walt as a person out there in the public eye. A lot of people thought he was a fictional character, you know, by the turn of the millennium. Uh, so she said, I'm going to pay for this exhibition so we can put it on. The Railroad Museum was very grateful. They asked what they could do in return. And uh, she said, well, I wouldn't mind a private tour because if it gets out that I'm there, then people want autographs. And I just want to go with my you know, kids and my grandkids and just have a nice time. So we're walking through the uh, roundhouse where we had set up this display before it opened to the public. And we happened to go through one of the uh, Santa Fe dining cars that they have on display there. There's this famous story that uh, Kimball would tell about uh, he and Walt going out to the Chicago Rail Fair. They took the, the California Zephyr to go there and they were riding on the uh, dining car uh, and Kimball wanted to order the Santa Fe stew. The only place you could get it was on board this train. He'd heard about it. So they sit down, waiter comes over. He uh, says, I'll have the Santa Fe stew. And Walt looks at him and says, Kimball, we're traveling first class. We'll have two New York steaks, right? And Kimball would tell the story. And he told it to me personally, uh, you know, to, to show that Walt Disney was always in charge. Even when it was on the clock or not on the clock, he was still in charge, right? So we're standing in that very car where that story would have taken place. And I remind Diane of this story. And she looks at me and she says, you know, that's not true, right? <laughs> and I said, but Kimball told me directly. And she said, yeah, Kimball told me that story too. <laughs> and this is while Ward was still alive. She says, look, I love Ward Kimball, but he never lets the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> Dad hated steak. He would have ordered the stew. And then I realized how true that was. Walt famously had very simple tastes. And he developed that, frankly, being poor growing up in Marceline. Mm. He liked corned beef and hash, and he liked hamburgers. He was not into lobsters and steaks and all that kind of stuff. 
And, and so it just showed that, yeah, it's a great story, probably not true. And that's the situation with uh, the Harper Goff story. It, it is a wonderful story, probably not true. You know, it's not a surprise, though. When you put this many storytellers together, they're going to come up with much better legends than, than the reality, for sure. But there's plenty of interesting <laughs> stories. I wanted to ask you a little bit about Diane Disney Miller, um, because, of course, you worked with her on different projects. And, and she's very, as you said, integral in saving um, Walt's Barn, which uh, you did with... Uh, the mm-hmm. Carolwood Society. And, and you know, basically, she, in many ways, was the one who curated her father's legacy beyond being, as you sort of suggest, like another Colonel Sanders, where you really don't know him beyond the the thing that that's, it's selling. Um, and, and she really did kind of uh, champion um, him as a, as a whole person. What were your, your interactions like with her? And, and, and what did you find uh, in her that uh, reminded you of stories you've heard of Walt? Wow, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I, I could talk about Diane for, for hours. Uh, Diane, when, when someone passes away, there's a tendency to always say wonderful things about them. And that, that's a polite thing to do. Uh, everyone, uh, every story about Diane that's nice is absolutely true. And I'd say it whether she was here or not, <laughs> uh, she was remarkable. Uh, she was genuine. She was wickedly funny, uh, kind, uh, direct. There, there was no hidden agenda with, uh, Diane. You knew exactly what she thought. Um, but she, she had this, this great passion for people and her family, and she was fiercely protective of her father's legacy. Uh, I, I mentioned Ratlaw earlier. So the, the Disney family continued to own Ratlaw. Uh, they ended up divesting a lot of, of their interest in, in Disney, but she, she still wanted to make sure that the company kept kind of a, a, a moral bead on what Walt was all about. And this is, this is not meant to be some gloss. Everything that, that he did was absolutely perfect. She wanted to make sure that people understood he was a real human being that faced real challenges. Uh, in his own words, he had a nervous breakdown in the thirties from the pressures of running the studio. He was a chain smoker and it took his life way early decades earlier than it, and than it should have been. Uh, and she doesn't want people to forget about these things because they're really important. I think, moreover, the, the thing that's truly remarkable about Walt, from her perspective, was that this is the guy that, that was told constantly, don't do this, you're going to fail. That's dumb. Don't do it. What, don't go out to California. Don't start a, a studio. Don't make the, the world's first you know, motion picture cartoon. You're going to lose your money. It was called, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was called Disney's Folly before it opened, right? Uh, don't get involved with amusement parks. Don't, don't, don't. Everybody told him that. And and if he believed in it, he stuck with it. It didn't mean that they always paid off. Fantasia was a financial flop. Of course, we recognize it now as the masterpiece that it is. But in its time, it didn't resonate with audiences. Mm-hmm. In fact, I don't think it made money during Walt's lifetime. It was only through re-releasing every seven or eight years that eventually the thing would, would make money. Uh, so it's, it's not like he had a magic wand and everything was perfect, but when he had a setback, he didn't let it get him down. He brushed himself off. He figured what was wrong and what was right. He believed in himself and he pushed forward and he found the right people to help him achieve those things. And that's, that's a story that every one of us can learn from. Mm -hmm. This is not some person who, you know, was gifted from the heavens to us and, and, you know, a a God walking among the mortals. He was a regular guy, but he was a regular regular guy that didn't give up. And it's kind of like Mickey Mouse, you know, he's plucky, he finds a way to get it done, and then, you know, generally prevails. And and that's something we can all learn from. And that's the message she wanted to make sure was not getting lost. And to be fair, the there's a lot of folks at the studio in the early 2000s, still are, uh, who have great admiration and respect for what Walt was as a person. And, and you still see this represented in a lot of things that the company is doing. But by and large, they weren't about making documentaries about Walt Disney. You know, they were interested in running a mm-hmm. business. And Walt had become a little bit of an airbrushed image by, you know, the, the late 1990s. Uh, there was one specific moment that really resonated with Diane. There was a uh, survey of uh, college freshmen conducted, and I don't remember the year, but it was probably around 95. And 70% of college freshmen thought that Walt Disney was a fictional character. Mm-hmm. A corporate image that, you know, like Betty Crocker or Aunt Jemima, somebody that never existed, that was just made up, right? 
And that bugged her because if you don't understand he was real and don't understand his struggles, then how can you be inspired by them? Mm. How can you, you learn from that and try to better yourself? And, and that manifested itself uh, first in uh, uh, the uh, old museum at uh, the uh, Presidio across from the Palace of Fine Arts. Uh, when we were setting up the barn at uh, Griffith Park, Walt's uh, backyard uh, railroad barn, uh, when they decided to sell the Disney family estate, she called Michael Brogy and said, I really want to save dad's barn. That was his happy place. And so we took it apart board by board and ended up reassembling it at the Los Angeles Life Steamers, which is close to the studio. And Walt was a founding member of that organization. So it was very appropriate, but it was just an empty barn. And we said, well, we should put stuff in it. And all the family stuff had been put into storage. And so we went over to uh, the storage facility on Flower Street, just down the street from uh, Imagineering. And uh, we're going through these boxes and containers and such, looking for railroad things to put in the barn to operate it as a little mini museum. And I will never forget this. You know, we're, we're looking through stuff, and what's this? Oh, it's the Presidential Medal of Freedom given to Walt. <laughs> All right, well, that's not train-related. What else you got? And there was this Florsheim shoebox, and it had um, tissue paper in it. And inside, there was this little Oscar. It looked like the Oscar statue, but it was maybe, you know, four inches tall. Oh, there are seven of them. It was it was the Oscar <laughs> given to Walt uh, uh, for seven uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. The only time the Academy has ever made a special Oscar was for that film, full size Oscar and seven miniature ones, uh, and, in a uh, Florsheim shoebox in a storage facility. Mm. And she said, uh, "You know, my my kids, you know, my grandkids have never seen this stuff. I've got to get it out so they can see it." So she bought one of the converted warehouses at the Presidio and opened it up as this little mini museum. Roger Brogy Jr. built a trestle so the Lily Bell could be displayed. And we ended up borrowing that when we went up and uh, set up the museum uh, exhibition in Sacramento. Uh, and they had these beautiful display cases built. And she said, you know, we can have school groups come through. We could have people come in and study. Maybe we could have a little cafe. And in just the same way that that Mickey Mouse Park became Disneyland, this, this little humble barracks thing became the Walt Disney Family Museum uh, at the Presidio. So an interesting parallel there. And, and if you have a chance, uh, I assume you have, but if any of your listeners haven't, if you have a chance when all of this COVID-19 and stuff is over, please make your way out to the uh, uh, Walt Disney Family Museum in San Francisco. It is the most immersive, most most personal way to get to know Walt Disney that, that's possible. People would often ask Diane to write um, a book about her experiences. Uh, there was an official one. Uh, that was published in the 50s, started out as a serial for the Saturday Evening Post, and it was condensed into a book called My Dad, Walt Disney. Uh, but Diane was very candid about that. She didn't write that book. Uh, her, her dad dictated that book to uh, Pete Martin, and she sat there and listened. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of a way for Walt to, to get uh, some money to uh, her and her husband, Ron Miller, when they first got married. Uh, and so people were saying, you should write your own personal book. And uh, once the museum was built, she said, this is my book. Hmm. A story like Walt Disney's can't be read. It has to be experienced. And if you want to experience it, come in here. Uh, and it is, it is truly remarkable. So all the things that I talked about, Walt, um, uh, Diane having this passion for caring forward her father's legacy, warts and all, is, is represented in the Walt Disney Family Museum. Let's talk a little bit about the, uh, your experience with the museum, of course. You had an exhibit there called All Aboard, A Celebration of Walt's Trains. It ran for about two years. How did um, that invitation come about uh, to create that? Was it just through this whole process of, of uh, working with the Lilybell and all this other stuff that it just seemed like the right fit? And, uh, you know, you had, I guess, like 5,000 square feet to fill. Did you find that to be a, a welcome challenge and you didn't know what to... Uh, leave out or did it uh, was it one of those things where you're like I'm not sure what how to fill all of it <laughs> no no quite the opposite it was what do I leave out because there was just too much mm. so a, a little bit of background uh, after the Sacramento exhibition concluded I helped Disneyland put on a uh, little mini exhibition in the Disney gallery on Main Street um, and and Diane had been very encouraged by what she was seeing as people responded to these kind of things. And that's when she's decided to to work on what would become the, the Walt Disney Family Museum. And I was invited to participate in that because Diane called me her train guy. Uh, and uh, considering who she was, this was probably one of the highest honors I've ever been mm. paid. 
Uh, so I helped uh, design and develop the railroad-related exhibits within the Walt Disney Family Museum's permanent galleries, uh, the trains that Walt knew growing up, uh, the, the Carrollwood uh, display model at Disneyland, and so forth. It was a great experience. And as I was working with Diane and her family, uh, I would say, you know, there's so much about this, and it's such an important story. Uh, what do you think about doing a, a dedicated exhibition? And they had acquired the former gymnasium at the Presidio to use as a rotating uh, exhibition space. Um, and they, they actually had this big roll-up door in the back. And I said, you know, I, I know how we can get the combine car, which was Walt's favorite from the Walt Disney or from uh, the Disneyland and Santa Fe Railroad, and uh, get that in there and people would walk through it. Logistically, we couldn't get that together. But she never gave up on the idea. Uh, unfortunately, she passed away before we could actually uh, open the, the exhibition. But, but I was able to work with uh, her husband, Ron, and, and her kids, uh, uh, Walter uh, Miller and, and Joanna Miller. And, uh, and, and we did our very best to create an exhibition of which I, I would hope if she had been able to be there, she would have been proud. Uh, and, and we had a lot of space, as you said, to fill. Uh, I organized it into 10 rooms uh, that would start kind of chronologically, kind of like a train trip. You start one place and you end up in another. And we wanted to, to touch on that. So we, we start with Walt's story growing up in Marceline and all the way through Carrollwood. Uh, but we didn't want the story to, to end in 1966. We wanted to show how that legacy has been furthered and continued on. So we looked at, at Disney trains uh, around the world. Uh, we looked at some things that had been planned, uh, but not yet realized. And I'm careful to say not yet realized, because if there's one thing I've learned hanging out with all these Imagineers is that really great ideas don't mm. die. They just wait for their time. Yeah. <laughs> So there are concepts that have uh, come up that haven't been built yet, but you know, I think they may still see the light of day at some point. And then we made it relevant by showing how uh, there were things today, you know, at that precise moment that were still uh, involving trains and, and Disney. And we did this through uh, Pixar, who had released uh, or was just about to release Inside Out and Big Hero 6. And they all featured trains in, in some capacity or another. Uh, and and it, did, it didn't run for two years, but it got extended twice. Uh, and it um, had, and I, I don't know more about the recent exhibitions, but it had very high uh, exit satisfaction surveys. Mm -hmm. People really connected with this because it had kinetic energy. There was something for kids. It was, you know, I'd like to think it was fun. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we were very happy with how uh, that turned out. Uh, and uh, we, we had just great cooperation from all sorts of folks to make that uh, possible. And uh, archives the walt disney archives walt disney imagineering everybody just jumped in to help and it was it was a heartwarming experience i'm curious about the process of creating a museum exhibit i like it, it's a very specific uh type of creative outlet and i'm curious what sort of decisions you have to make when you consider like how you're going to place things or deciding how do you I guess the best way to put it is how do you explain a narrative in a way that people can walk through it? Did you find that to be a uh, like a uh, a challenge or was it something that that came kind of natural for you? Well, the first and foremost, it's it's a collaborative effort, and that's really key. Uh, I had the great fortune of being called the curator, but what we're able to do there, what we've done several times at Disneyland, what we've done at the Napa Valley Museum, and what we will do at future exhibitions, is is really representative of folks getting together and say, how might we or how could we? Wouldn't this be fun? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't this be cool? We, we try to take what's called a design thinking approach. And that is, is that rather than us project what somebody wants, we think, well, what would they want? You know, how do they want to experience mm -hmm. it? Uh, a great example of design thinking is uh, iPhones or Google phones. They, they work the way you want to. Those of us who are old enough remember having Palm Pilots, which insisted on using a stylus, which is not the way I want to work. And that's <laughs> why none of us carry around Palm Pilots anymore. So we took the same approach to this. What do we want people to see? How is stuff revealed? How can they explore? Uh, and we were faced with tough trade-offs. And that was something that uh, always makes me a little sad, uh, but it also kind of forces some creativity. We had some really great stories to tell. But when you're trying to move people through a museum, you can't have folks essentially sit and read six pages of text at every display. Mm -hmm. 
they have to keep moving. And frankly, not everybody is that interested in the minutia. But we wanted to serve both audiences. To solve this problem, we filmed vignettes and that would set up and explain, kind of like mini documentaries. Uh, so they, they would play when someone took their smart device and named it these QR codes that we put by certain uh, exhibits. And that way, those people who wanted to know more could do so, you know, and, and hear all these stories about Harper Goff and Ward Kimball and Ollie Johnson and so forth. And if people just wanted to come through and look at the pretty trains and the cartoons and such, then that's great. Mm. They experienced it. We wanted to try to make it a personalized, rich experience for each person, irrespective of how much time they, they had to invest in it. So the, the, the bottom line in all this is that we, we wanted to, frankly, take a lesson from Walt. He was one of the finest storytellers that humanity has ever known. I don't think there's any question about it. It was his special gift. He wrote an article for the Railroader magazine, and it was called I've Always Loved Trains. Uh, and he, he laid out his whole story, what was important to him and what he was thinking. Now, in reality, it was probably ghostwritten by a studio publicist, but there's no question that it's, it's his voice in there. And so I thought when you're creating an exhibition uh, that's involving the, the personal life of one of the world's greatest storytellers, don't try to outdo them. <laughs> Let them tell their own story. And that's, that's really what I did. Uh, if you look at what we did there in Napa, we, we just got out of Walt's way. He told the story and we found a way to create supporting interactive visuals that would allow somebody to experience it and be tactically involved and hands on and really walk through the story that he had verbally told all those years ago. Well, something we should note, of course, is that we've talked a lot about trains, Disney-oriented in California, but there are trains here in, in Florida as well that you've had your hand in. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Fort Wilderness Campground area and what that meant to you, and then, of course, what was running there uh, for quite some time. When uh, Walt passed away in, in 1966, they had really just started serious work on the Florida Project. Uh, which they were calling Disney World, and which uh, Roy Disney rebranded Walt Disney World, so it would be a tribute to his brother and his lifelong business partner. All the folks that worked on the original design and, and construction of Walt Disney World, though, were, were directly related to working to, for Walt. I mean, they, they had spent years, decades, working with Walt Disney. So the, the, even though he wasn't there to personally supervise his his philosophies, his kind of his DNA was still represented in the way things were laid out. Uh, and of course, the, the Magic Kingdom had to have its own railroad. Um, and those trains were rescued from uh, uh, Mexico from being scrapped and, and they were rebuilt and, and beautified. And now they, they operate to this day in uh, the Magic Kingdom. There was a plan for a couple of hotels uh, on the shores of uh, Bay Lake. And uh, there was the uh, Polynesian and the Contemporary, they also wanted to have a reasonably priced campground. Walt was insistent upon this. In fact, his original sketches for uh, Epcot and, and what would eventually become the Magic Kingdom was to have a campground so that people could uh, go and experience it without having to spend a lot of money to stay in a hotel. When they got together to plan out the details of the campground, they, they took a, a page from his book, which is you, the, the Disney attractions work best when they feel like you have left today and entered another romantic time. The backstory behind Fort Wilderness, the name of the campground, uh, was that it sat in the American frontier of the 1870s, 1880s. It did not make sense to have buses roam, you know, roam people around <laughs> at something that would have taken place 100 years prior. They intended to have a live steam railroad. It would be scaled down a little bit so that it wouldn't dwarf tents and campers and such like that. They based it on a locomotive uh, that Baldwin built for uh, use in the Hawaiian plantations and was owned by one of Walt Disney's friends, Jerry Best. It's called the Olamana, currently on display as part of the Smithsonian's ex uh, exhibits. <clears throat> so it's this cute little engine, and it would pull a five-train passenger car that would uh, surround, the or, uh, surround the campground and be the primary form of transportation when you were staying there. Uh, it opened officially on uh, January 1st, 1974, and ran intermittently through, and depending on who you ask, 77, but we have evidence that it stretched into the 80s. Uh, and, and it was not 
quite the success it should have been. People loved the theming. They loved having a live train there. But there, there were some logistical barriers to it. When you ride the trains at Disneyland or Walt Disney World or, or Paris or Hong Kong, they are isolated from everything else. There's no place where human beings cross the tracks. At Fort Wilderness, mm. there were 11 grade crossings where cars or bicyclists or uh, pedestrians would walk. So there was an element of danger there that wasn't present on the other ones. Uh, they didn't do a particularly great job of installing the physical railroad. Uh, and they had a, a lot of uh, derailments as a result, then they would eventually pull it all out and put it back in. So they, they wanted to keep it going, but that, that caused a delay. But probably the, the biggest single problem with the Fort Wilderness Railroad is that people love riding the Disney trains in the parks, and then they go someplace else to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> when, when you're in a cabin or an RV or especially a tent, you don't necessarily want to be 11 feet away from a steam locomotive. <laughs> the, they make a lot of noise. They, they have bells that have to ring when they're going into certain areas. And, and most pressingly, they have a whistle. And the whistles that were put on these locomotives uh, can be heard three and a half miles away. Three and a half miles away. So imagine you are just, you know, 100 yards from it. And it's running from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., seven days a week. Not a great experience. Yeah, there's your wake-up call right? for sure. <laughs> it's your wake-up call. And so while people have fond memories of it, it really wasn't that popular with the guests. So rather than, than uh, continue to invest in it, uh, as the engines needed to be pulled out for service, they just didn't service the engine. And so they got down to where there was only one train. It wasn't running every day. And then when it needed service, they just said, don't bother. Uh, but the, the Imagineers never gave up on it. They wanted, They loved that little railroad. There have only been six locomotives built by uh, the Walt Disney Company. Engines one and two at Disneyland, the C.K. Holiday and the E.P. Ripley, were built at the Burbank Studio. Uh, and then the four Fort Wilderness uh, trains were built at uh, Mapo in uh, Glendale. Mm -hmm. That's it. Everything else has been a, re a restoration of somebody else's product or brand new construction by a modern company. And, and so they loved these things. They wanted to preserve them. There was talk of using them at... Uh, Disneyland Paris, that didn't materialize. There was talk of using them at what was going to be called Buffalo Junction that was going to be an entertainment district, essentially where the um, Wilderness Lodge is located uh, in uh, Lake Buena Vista today. Uh, that didn't happen. Meanwhile, the trains had been pulled out of the roundhouse where they were at and left to kind of rust away um, in an open area. And they were getting to the point where people were stealing stuff off of them and they were going to get scrapped. And I, I became aware of this through Michael's book. He wrote this chapter saying they're sitting there awaiting an uncertain fate. And and that was, you know, like dangling red meat in front of my dog. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought we got to save these trains. Uh, so we went out and we, we talked to the company and we got a lot of enthusiastic support from the people in the parks, Imagineering. You know, a little bit of a snag with legal, but we were able to work through this with the help of uh, Roy Edward Disney, Walt's nephew, who was vice chair of the company at the time. And we were able to rescue the uh, the trains, mm. uh, the four locomotives and I think 16 passenger cars. And they're all in various states of uh, restoration, all safe, all protected now. So uh, someday, every last bit of that will be preserved for future generations. Uh, and I, I would like to think out of all the things that we've done, that probably had the biggest impact. That's going to pay dividends that, that are going to last well beyond all of our lifetimes. In much the same way that, that Walt's passion for trains resulted in 100,000 people a day riding on a real, genuine, steam-powered railroad. Well, and of course, uh, much like how Walt had a railroad in his backyard, you also have yourself the number four engine uh, from Fort Wilderness Railroad in your backyard. Tell us a little bit about that restoration project, and um, is, it, is it still something that you, uh, I'm sure it is, but is it, the, is it the thing that you have to show off to anyone that pop buys the house, and, and do you find yourself just sitting in it now and then when you need a good moment? <laughs> Uh, so if, if you're going to put a uh, train in your backyard, just like Walt, it's very, very helpful to have an understanding wife. <laughs> uh, I've always loved trains, as you've probably guessed by this point. I had uh, a backyard railroad, but a garden scale one uh, that I had wanted to build for some time. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm, I'm so frustrated with my abilities as a modeler, I found ways to get other people to make these things. And that's why... <laughs> 
Heartland Locomotive Works made a model of the Lily Bell. AccuCraft did. Uh, we, we've made all these different uh, uh, models of Disney trains because I wanted one and I wasn't very good at modeling. And so I had to figure out how to get one made. <laughs> I figured I wasn't the only person. So they ended up becoming products that were sold through the parks and such like that. When we went to buy our, our current home, my uh, wife knew I wanted enough space in the backyard to run this garden scale or G scale railroad, as they're called. And uh, large, large lots in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area are kind of rare. And, and we we're very fortunate to have about a half acre. And she she goes back there and she looks at it and she says, you know, Mike, this is so big. We could put a real train back here. <laughs> and I, I didn't need anything else at that point. Uh, I just had to find the real train. And... Uh, you know the story of how we were able to rescue the train, so I was able to, uh, to put it into the backyard. My wife calls it our 12-ton lawn ornament. <laughs> uh, it's not uh, currently moving, uh, but uh, someday when I have uh, enough time and enough money, <laughs> that's the key. My hope is to uh, to restore it to its original condition. And uh, yes, occasionally I do find myself sitting out in the backyard thinking about life uh, in, uh, in that locomotive. Um, I should also ask about, uh, a thing that you're the, one of the managing, you're the managing director of, uh, I-5 attractions and entertainment development. Um, what made you decide to get into attraction creation, uh, in, in that field? You know, it's one of those things that you just kind of happen. You could not possibly have predicted any of this. I, I, you know, when I was this little kid, you know, going on my first train ride, the thought that I'd be working for Walt Disney's family, developing railroad attractions for a museum just yeah i couldn't have predicted it but yet that's exactly what happened a lot of folks had a chance to come out and see the san francisco uh, exhibition and uh, we had interest from other museums around the world to stage it there and for a number of logistical reasons not the least of which is that you know it's hard to take you know truly uh one-of-a-kind artifacts and, and send them into other countries and hope they come back you know, we, we didn't want to stage the exact same show abroad, but it revealed that there was this interest in trains and museums and such. So uh, we were contacted saying we want to develop this this attraction in China. Uh, and and through my friends, I was able to form this partnership we call I-5. And, and so we've been doing that. And along the way, we just kind of backed into it. We ended up designing the very first purpose built tourist railroad in, in China, mm. uh, which was under construction, but obviously... The pandemic has put a, a pause in that. Uh, and, and so you can see, if you go to our, our website, you can see some of the concept work that we, we did on that. And that has just led to other projects. Uh, so it's, it's, it's something I never could have predicted. And, and I'm, I'm delighted every day that I'm able to be able to do these things. And simply because this is a Disney-focused podcast and the folks like that gravitate towards that love trivia, I'm going to explain the name I-5. <laughs> when Walt decided to do the Florida project. Uh, it was all swampland in central Florida. And it, it was, you know, not worth a lot, 10 cents an acre, because it would take a lot of money to, to make it habitable. Well, they had a lot of money, but they didn't want word to get out that they were acquiring all this land because then the speculators would jump in and the, the costs would skyrocket. So they set up these phantom corporations to go out there and acquire all this land. One of them was called Compass East and so forth. They came up with a name I-4, A-Y-E-F-O-U-R, and it's a pun on Interstate 4, <laughs> which runs through the Disney property in, in Florida. <laughs> so being a complete geek, I knew that, and I thought, well, it's time to build our own company, and some of us are up here, and, and uh, some of us are, are located in Southern California. One of our partners uh, was a senior creative director at Walt Disney Imagineering, uh, and we're connected by I-5, and that's where we got the name. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, I'm curious, uh, as you sort of uh, ponder the future, what do you think uh, are your goals uh, for train-oriented or train-related things as you, as you look into uh, the next couple of years? What, what, not, maybe not even Disney stuff, but what sort of train things have you yet to accomplish that you still would like to? Well, there's, there's two big things on the horizon. Uh, the, the first is that that exhibition in San Francisco turned into the little exhibition that could. I thought it would be one and done. Really didn't think, you know, it would, you know, be re repeated. And Ron Miller really loved it. And he was a patron of the uh, Napa Valley Museum in Yountville mm. and would help them with some of their uh, exhibitions over the years. His home uh, up there was was fairly close by. 
And he said, you know, you guys should put on this little train show that we did. Uh, and so the, the museum st uh, team up there reached out and we all thought it was a great idea and, and we put it on. Now, it was a smaller venue, so we couldn't put it on quite to the scale that we did in San Francisco. But the main story beats were there. Uh, and we were able to plus it up a little bit. Along the way, I've become very good friends with uh, Bill Rogers and Camille Dixon, who are the voices of Disneyland and uh, DCA. Uh, respectively, and uh, Bill recorded a, a narration for it so that you could walk through and he'll, Bill playing a, a steam engineer, a train engineer, describing the different uh, uh, exhibits that we had there. Uh, and so folks came out and saw that, and now we've been contacted and said, well, we'd like to put it on in our museum. And, and so it, it's this little little exhibition that I keep thinking, okay, now we're done, and, and then it keeps going <laughs> on. And, and I can't reveal the next location, but I can tell you we're actively planning it obviously on hold right now, but uh, we're hoping that uh, when the world settles down to a, a better place that uh, we'll be able to pick that back up and, and look to uh, open it either late this year or next year. So that, that's the, the how can we inspire people through the story of Walt Disney's life aspect. The other is, is that trains, it's odd, even though people don't really ride them that much, uh, even though they don't work on the railroads that much, there's still something magical about them. Kids still love them. Uh, and I don't know exactly how to put my finger on it. It's something that you feel more than you can describe, I think. Uh, but we've seen that in the exhibitions. We've seen that uh, in, in other things that we've done. And, and so we're developing an interactive concept right now that leverages railroading in a completely new way. It, it, it fuses uh, interactivity with railroading uh, we, we actually trademark the name interactive because it, 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 it puts people into a situation but lets them interact with their environment. Mm -hmm. And it does it uh, through the, the, the motif of railroading. And I really can't go into any more detail about that, but we're super excited about it. And uh, once uh, the world is done with the lockdown, we'll be uh, back at that uh, with our full attention. Well, we're excited for that, and we will keep our ears up for more information when it becomes available. Michael Campbell, thank you so much for coming on DreamFinders. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this. And that's it for this episode of DreamFinders. I'd like to thank Michael Campbell for being my guest. And if you'd like to keep up with what he's doing at i5, check out their website, i-5.com. That's A-Y-E-5.com. DreamFinders is edited by Shannon Mickelson with quality control by Ben Harris. It's hosted and produced by yours truly, Nathan Hartman, who you can follow on Twitter at Some Stuff I Said. Our podcast artwork is provided by J.P. Tanner. Find his other work at tanwoodcreative.com. This podcast is distributed by WDW News Today, the worldwide leader in Disney Parks news. Read all they have to offer at wdwnt.com. Tell your friends about the show, and please, please give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And if you or someone else you know would make a great guest on this program, feel free to email us at dreamfinders at wdwnt.com. I'm Nathan Hartman, and remember, if we can dream it, then we can do it.